Warning, this episode contains spoilers and strong language. They said we're gonna put a play together Though we don't know yet what it's about We'll let everybody be in it So that there's no one left to be in the crowd No, you think I'm wasting time here Not sculpting up an image to play this is my last letter, and here's the last thing I'll say. This episode was recorded before Joel Schumacher passed away in June of 2020. Welcome, everybody, to the latest episode of Schumacast. I am Noel. Joining me, as always, is Angie. Hello, everybody. And we have a returning guest. It's been so long since we recorded with you last, Melissa. Hello! <laughs> it feels like forever ago. Right? <laughs> it was so many hours. <laughs> <laughs> so fun fact, she was on our Batman and Robin episode, our previous episode, which we recorded a week ago. Yep. So yes. <laughs> we were doing two back-to-back <laughs> Melissa episodes. In my luxurious <laughs> basement studios. Mm. <laughs> there is only part of a ceiling. <laughs> Basement studios with only part of a ceiling is very fitting for our current topic of choice, 8mm. My god, yes. Yes. <laughs> we had you for two very contrasting films here. Yeah, I noticed. And again, bringing you in because of your expertise with the noir genre. You want to tell people a little bit about where they can find your work? I have a couple of older podcasts that are still out there for consumption. One of them is Real Education Noir, where we focused on noir films and showing them to people who had never seen them before. That one's on uh, hiatus. We know that just means it's done. But still currently running, the main Real Education website at realedu.com is still running and still available, and we're still occasionally recording episodes of it. So yeah, we are here for 8mm. A little backstory on this one. After Batman and Robin, Joel was slated to direct Runaway Jury, his third John Grisham film, okay, which would have starred Edward Norton, Gwyneth Paltrow, and Sean Connery. Oh, wow. Goodness. Unfortunately, he was so burned out by the making of and the reception of Batman and Robin that he needed a break. I don't blame him. So he went down to Mexico for a few months. Just kind of chilled out. And it's worth pointing out that around this time was when Joel finally became sober. Oh, okay. I don't know if that was during this trip, but we pointed out that Joel had done a lot of hard drugs in the 60s, had Mm -hmm. quit them, but he still was a heavy drinker. And he would go and drink and party between films and then clean up and sober up for the actual production of the films. And then as soon as they wrap, go party and drink and go wild again. Mm -hmm. And there was a period where he realized he just couldn't keep doing that. And so he did finally become sober. And I know I saw some interviews with him just a couple years ago where he had been talking about that he'd been sober since the late 90s. Okay. So when he returned home to Hollywood, he started looking around for projects he could do on a gritty low budget. And that's when Amy Pascal at Sony handed him the script for 8mm. <laughs> and 8mm was written by Andy Kevin Walker, who was a Tower Records employee <laughs> who tried to break into Hollywood with his first spec script, Seven, but that mm-hmm. became one of those notorious scripts that everyone passed around and wanted to read and nobody wanted to make. Mm-hmm. And while that was passing around, he did manage to get some writing gigs out of it. He wrote Brain Scan and Hideaway. He wrote a couple episodes of Tales from the Crypt and Perversions of Science. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, I remember Perversions of Science. Oh, yeah. There's a <laughs> really fun episode starring Kevin Pollack, directed by William Shatner, that's an absolute hoot. Oh, wow. <laughs> And then finally, by the mid-90s, David Fincher and Brad Pitt and Morgan Freeman got Seven made, and it became the notorious classic that it is. Mm -hmm. So everyone was suddenly like, hey, what do you got next? And he handed them the script to 8mm, and that became another script that everyone wanted to read and nobody (laughs) wanted to make. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Like Even Paul Verhoeven and William Friedkin turned this script down as being too intense. (laughs) (laughs) You know you've got it turned way up when Paul Verhoeven goes, no, that's weird. (laughs) And it was when he was talking to the producers that they mentioned to Joel that this is kind of a dangerous script and it might get some bad publicity. And he's like, oh, tell me more. (laughs) Because again, like with Falling Down, he really liked to do stuff that he knew was going to stir up the pot, Mm -hmm. you know, get reactions from people. 
Unfortunately, working with Andrew Kevin Walker, Walker has really come out as saying how disappointed he was with the experience of working with Joel, which was disappointing him because he was a big fan of Joel's work Mm. and has to this day refused to ever watch the finished film. Oh, interesting. And I actually have a little quote here from Andrew Kevin Walker. And by the way, there is a wonderful published omnibus of the seven and eight millimeter screenplays that has this wonderful introduction interview with Andrew Kevin Walker. And this is a bit where he says, early on, Schumacher gave me some good notes and I incorporated them. But before too long, he handed me a cut and paste version of the script that he had done, which is what it sounds like. He had rearranged the script and rewritten certain scenes, rewritten a great deal of the voiceover dialogue from the diary of the murdered girl. He took the second act and chopped scenes into smaller pieces and reshuffled them, I think in an attempt to keep the audience from ever getting bored for a second. The problem I had with that was the story wasn't sustaining its misery or suspense anymore. In my opinion, nor was it sustaining its reality. What Schumacher had rewritten, granted he wanted me to go over these scenes and polish them, I didn't care for. Understand it's not a matter of who's right or who's wrong. In a situation like that, as a writer getting notes, if you're interested, you can only make the changes you agree with. After a while, I just couldn't make certain changes. I was physically unable to incorporate certain notes, and that's how strongly I disagreed. Once you've come to loggerheads, you either have to make the changes and hand in a script you think you're making worse rather than better, or you can step aside and let them. The director, the studio, whomever, fulfill their vision of a project, and that's what I did. Hmm. And so Joel brought in for rewrites Nicholas Kazan, the son of Hollywood legend Elia Kazan, Mm -hmm. who had written the films Francis, At Close Range, Patty Hearst, Reversal of Fortune, Dream Lover, Matilda, Fallen, and Bicentennial Man. Oh, boy. Okay. This is actually one of my favorite scripts. I've read it four times. I've even read it like twice decades before I even saw the movie. I think the first time I saw it was at your movie night, Melissa. Mm -hmm. The finished film is, I want to say, like a good 80, 85 percent still what Andrew Kevin Walker wrote. And a lot of the changes are just let's do something slightly differently, but it's still the same thing. Mm -hmm. There's very little that's actually been heavily changed. It's more just the context or the perspective of things. We'll get into it a little more as we go in, but it's still a very close script to what was written. Okay. Okay. And after 8mm, Walker's career has been a bit sporadic. He did rewrites on Fight Club, The Game, A Stir of Echoes, and Event Horizon, and did original drafts which were subsequently rewritten for X-Men, Sleepy Hollow, and The Wolfman. Original scripts like Psycho Killer and Red, White, Black, and Blue have continued to float around Hollywood, again, with people always wanting to read them but not actually make them. And his big return to screenwriting was the Titmouse animated original film Nerdland. Huh. <laughs> And in 2015, he released his first novella, Old Man Johnson, which Kindle awarded as their best Kindle original of the year. Hmm, okay. Huh. And that's all I've got for production notes. So let me just dive into the synopsis here. Tom Wells is an average suburban private eye with a wife and kid and a reputation for thoroughness and professionalism. When he's hired by Mrs. Christian, the widow of a recently deceased steel magnate, it's because she discovered an 8mm film in her husband's safe which appears to show a teenage girl being viciously assaulted and murdered by a masked man. Upon viewing the film, Wells wants to go to the police, but Mrs. Christian and her lawyer, Daniel Longdale, task him with seeing if it's real or fake, and if it's real, learn who the girl is. Leaving his family behind for what could be a few months, Wells starts digging into archives of missing and runaway children in an exhaustive search until he identifies the girl as Mary Ann Matthews, who disappeared when she ran away from home six years ago. Visiting Janet Matthews, Mary's grieving mother, Wells is able to search the house and discovers Mary's diary, revealing she wanted to escape the sexual abuse of her stepfather and ran off to Hollywood with a dream of acting alongside a boyfriend who quickly ditched her and is now in prison. When Mary's mother says she'd still like to know what happened even if it's that her daughter was killed, Wells leaves Mary's diary out where it will be found after he's gone. Descending into the seedy California world of underground and illegal porn, Wells is quick to befriend Max California, a young aspiring musician who knows the ins and outs of the industry. As Max guides him deeper and deeper, Wells also follows a note of Mary's to the production studio of Eddie Poole, a sleazy producer who preys on young talent. Wells soon links Eddie to Dino Velvet, a porno director known for his twisted avant-garde style, and when Max digs out a few of Dino's films, Wells recognizes the masked man from the snuff film, a sadistic bruiser only known in the industry as Machine. Traveling to Dino's studio in New York, Wells and Max make him an offer to commission a porno film in the hopes of luring in Machine and identifying all parties responsible for Mary's murder. Unfortunately, arriving at the set, Wells finds himself surrounded by an armed Dino, Eddie, and Machine, and at the mercy of the lawyer, Longdale, who was the middleman in commissioning the snuff film for the dead Mr. Christian. They use Max as a hostage to make Wells bring them the film, but then kill Max and destroy the only existing copy when he does. 
Wells fends off his own death by revealing how much was paid to commission the film, leading the others to realize Longdale screwed them over by skimming a significant portion for himself, leading to a confrontation where Longdale and Dino die, a machine is wounded, and Wells makes his escape. Getting his family out of their home for safety and learning that Mrs. Christian committed suicide after learning the film was real, Wells sets out to finish things. First, he tracks down Eddie, who's packing up to flee, and makes the man bring him to the scene of the murder. Unable to actually unleash his vengeance upon the man, Wells places a phone call to Mary's mother, begging her for permission to take the actions that he needs in order to end this. After doing so, he beats Eddie to death and lights the house on fire. He then tracks down Machine to a small little home where he seems to be a kind neighbor who lives with his elderly mother. And when she goes off to church that day, suddenly heavy metal music is thrashing through the walls as Wells sneaks in and encounters Machine in a brutal fight where he unmasks the man and reveals he's just an average guy who really, really likes killing people. Wells kills him in a graveyard, which was there for some reason. (laughs) (laughs) I was wondering about that. Mood. (laughs) And then returns home and into the arms of his wife and child where he finally breaks down as the full consequences of the whole scenario that he's been through wash over him. And as he sets out the next day to return to the normalcy of raking his front yard, he receives a note from Mary's mother thanking him for everything that he did, even though it will never change the fact that her daughter is dead. So Angie. Yes. What is your history with 8mm and do you recommend it now? This movie came out right in the full strength of my Nicolas Cage obsession. Thanks to what Con Air and then The Rock and then wasn't there another one Face somewhere? Face Off. Off. That's it. Face <laughs> Off. We were literally just talking about that. He was, you know, at the height of his popularity and I was eating it up. So I was very, very excited to see the film. And I liked dark stuff. I think I had already probably seen Seven at this point and really liked that. So, you know, the thriller aspect of it was certainly not a turn off for me either. I remember liking it a lot. And then I don't think I ever watched it again. I definitely didn't like have it on DVD or anything. Now that I've watched it again today, I can kind of see why. I recommend it, but it's not like an overwhelmingly strong recommend. It has some issues, but I do think Nicolas Cage's performance alone is definitely enough to make it worth your time. Just probably not something you're going to want to watch over and over again. Melissa, what's your history with this one, and do you recommend it? I think the first time I saw it was at Nicolas Cage night, when Mm -hmm. I was showing every Nicolas Cage movie to friends to much delight. (laughs) I think it's a solid film, but like you said, Angie, it's not something I return to. And it's not necessarily because of the content is skeezy or anything like that. It's just, Mm -hmm. it's a solid film, but it also doesn't stick. You know, there's nothing Mm -hmm. that brings it up to the top of like, oh my God, you really must watch this. It's like, oh, you know. There are moments that I think kind of rise above being just plain, like, you know, anything with Peter Stamari in it is magic to me. But (laughs) other than that, some of the acting moments, it's like, oh, you know, solid film. It's there. It's fine. It didn't give me like the sense of atmosphere that Seven did. It doesn't elicit Mm -hmm. a strong reaction from me, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Mm. But then whenever Peter Stamari is on screen, it's like, oh my God, chew that scenery. (laughs) Chew it. Oh, yeah. (laughs) One other funny thing I forgot to mention from the trivia is David Fincher was offered this film and he's like, dude, I just did that. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And he was the one who recommended they pass it to Joel. Okay. Once they get to Alice Cars. David Fincher was a very good friend of Joel Schumacher and very influenced by his early films and considered him a mentor. Mm-hmm. Again, like I knew about this script for years because I first got into collecting screenplays in the mid to late 90s when I was a teenager. And Walker was already notorious for not only Seven, but the original draft of this had been floating around since then. Reading it then, it blew my mind. Red, White, Black, and Blue was another one of those notorious ones that just floated around. And that's Andrew Kevin Walker's love letter to 70s cop movies. Okay. And is just incredible. And I hope somebody makes it someday and they make it correctly. So I read it, and then I think I want to say like five years later, I got the published omnibus that had both 7 and 8 million, and I read it again. And I still had never seen it. And it wasn't until Melissa did the Nicolas Cage movie night, which this would have been about three years ago, I know. Yeah, that's about right. When we were getting up to it, I'm like, you know what? Screw it. I'm going to read that again. Since we're (laughs) finally going to watch 8mm, I had not really dug into Joel's films. I'd only heard by reputation that Andrew Cameron Walker was displeased with it. And so I'm just kind of like, yeah, I'm Mm. not interested because the writer is God. The writer is cool. (laughs) 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 I read the entire script again and we watched the movie and I'm just sitting there like, 
like, you know what? Hey, that ain't bad. Yeah. I think it's main two things. It's well cast. The actors are great. It does mm-hmm. capture the story. Mm-hmm. It does capture a lot of the tragedy and the horror of the story and of the themes and everything that are there. I think it's two major failings. I think Joel following Batman and Robin reined things in too much to yeah. the point mm-hmm. where there's no intensity to anything. Yeah. Until Nicolas Cage starts getting super intense. Yeah, and even mm-hmm. then it's just like little moments. You know, it's like yeah, the actual right. story doesn't have intensity. Like the scenes don't yeah. have this intensity that really just tightens the screws and really pulls you in. And it's a story about a world and it doesn't really make you feel like you're immersed in that world. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's a nicely produced TV movie adaptation of a best-selling thriller novel. It's got the story there. It's got good actors. It just doesn't have that extra punch, that extra bite mm-hmm. that really carries it. Like, again, Seven did. You know, Seven yeah. just really immersed you in yeah. the world of that story Absolutely. and into the themes that it was exploring. And this one, it's presenting them. It's not immersing you. Yeah. Seven feels like if you touch it, you'd like wipe your hands on your shirt. It's like, oh, yeah. God. Yes, absolutely. Whereas this is like, eh. Doesn't make you feel dirty afterwards. Doesn't make you feel dirty. It's not impactful as much as it should be. Right. Given what's happening. And despite that, I do still recommend it. It's a good little thriller. And it's a good enough story and good enough performances that it's absolutely worth a watch. Again, like Angie said, it's not one that I feel compelled to just go back and dig out every few years like I do seven. Mm -hmm. Where it's like, that's a nasty experience, but I want to experience it. Yeah. Right. What's in the box? Exactly. (laughs) And then this one, it's like, hey, I'll watch it when it comes around, but I don't feel driven. It's not like some taboo locked away tome that I don't know if I want to read it, but I want to read it. <laughs> <laughs> Again, like seven is one of those. Once you see, you can't unsee. Right. right. Eight millimeter is about that, but you don't really feel the same effect. Right. Mm-hmm. Let's go ahead and start with Nicolas Cage. Yes. <laughs> you want me to just talk about right, I mean, just, he's yeah. wonderful to look at as well. He was a lovely man. Yes. I mean, he's probably crazy in real life, too, and that probably helps a lot of his performances. But, <laughs> but, you know, besides that, he's very, very subtle. I don't really feel him as an everyman, I have to no. say. Like, I feel like he's supposed to be a lot more innocent and gentle feeling at the beginning of this movie, and I don't get that. Like, he seems just, to me, really obsessed with doing his job as best he can. But him and his wife, I'm not, like, really feeling a connection between the two of them. Right. But the deeper he gets and the more unsettled he becomes by what's happening around him, that's really where the strength of his performance is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I remember a quote about when Nicolas Cage was listed to be Superman once upon a time. Mm. I cannot remember who said this. I think it was somebody in the comics industry, but they hit the nail on the head. It's like, I would never, ever in my life believe that Nicolas Cage grew up in Kansas. Hmm. <laughs> so I think we agree on this, that he's not really an everyman character, but where he goes in the movie, that's where he's more comfortable being <laughs> as mm-hmm. a performer. You know how you could fix that? Clark Kent grew up on a Coppola vineyard. <laughs> <laughs> Quote unquote, fix. <laughs> yeah, I feel like this movie would benefit from having a lead actor who was known to be an everyman character, and then he goes to surprising places. Rather than having right. Nicolas Cage just like, I know he goes to surprising places. He's not doing anything surprising yet. I guess I just wait. Mm-hmm. The actor that leaps to mind is Richard Dreyfus or somebody like yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Somebody yeah. kind of nebbishy, but kind of nerdy, like nice family man guy. And then he gets just steeped in the grossness of all this. And that's when it gets mm-hmm. weird. That, I think, would help the movie a lot, honestly. I like his performance. So going ahead and bringing this one bit of the script is that the way the character was written was Walker specifically wanted to do someone who was against the stereotype of the hard-boiled, brutal private eye. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But then over the course of the story, they are made to become that. Makes sense. Especially as you get into the third act. It's like that is when they have become that Mickey Spillane, Don Mm -hmm. Westlake type hero who is just, I can't fix things. I can't solve things. I'm just going to make it end, Mm -hmm. you know? And he was supposed to start out as more of a Ken and Nebbishy accountant guy. Mm -hmm. He's a very thorough, very book smart private eye. And I think Nick Gage doesn't really... 
I'm still perfectly fine with Cage's performance. I like how he's subdued for the majority of the film. And then it's like, once he gets deeper and deeper in, it starts to break him up more and more. Mm -hmm. Again, you don't have that heavy of a contrast. So that's not necessarily a bad thing. It, it can still work without mm -hmm. that. I still think his performance is fine. I think the big thing is I like that he's a suburban picket fence guy who has a wife and a baby. He's basically like a normal dad in the suburbs. But we don't get enough of that relationship to not just have them be like the typical wife and kid who are always waiting at home. The one thing mm -hmm. that I also think is a little silly is, and I get why, you know, she brings up the smoking because obviously the further he gets into this, the harder he's going to smoke and he's not even going to worry about it anymore. But because there's so little there, you're setting mm -hmm. up a conflict between the two of them straight from the start mm -hmm. instead of showing them happy and together and, you know, they've got the baby and everything's wonderful. She's already going, you're lying to me. Yeah. So it's not as dramatic a change when they start to split. Yeah. And also you've got Catherine Keener in the role, who is a national treasure mm -hmm. as an actress, <laughs> and she has almost nothing to do. Right. Yeah. So she's struggling mightily with this script that gives her very little to do. Yeah. Also, I feel like the character almost behaves in really strange ways once it gets deeper into the film. You know, it's like, I'm going to leave you. No, mm -hmm. dude, he's trying to save your life. I know that's part of the push and pull of the scene, but it's like, would an actual human being be reacting the way she is? Mm -hmm. That's not a performance choice. That's in the script. Yeah. So I find that yeah. whole wife character a problem. <laughs> and everything from that wife character was in the Walker script. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I get that the idea was that she knows her husband can't tell her about his cases. Mm -hmm. So it's not so much mm -hmm. that she resents the lying, but it's just that she knows there's always a part of her husband that's sealed away. And yeah. the whole smoking thing is the one thing where she can be like well there hey i got you yeah she's very much like the wife character in seven yep but i think mm -hmm. the wife character in seven had two very important things one of course the twist of the ending <laughs> yeah. head in a box <laughs> but two also remember that scene that she had with morgan freeman where she just talks about right. how moving to the city was a mistake and i don't know if i want to have this baby mm -hmm. yeah just fully exploring this whole crushing world of this city where all this terrible stuff is happening in and I think mm -hmm. the wife in 8mm is so far removed from everything, we just don't get anything for her to do, and then there's no real reason mm -hmm. for her to be even be there. She's literally just the woman he comes home to. Right. She literally has two scenes that are practically exactly the same. How's the baby doing? Oh, she's sweet. She misses you. Yeah. It's like, come on. Little variety. Little meat here. Yeah, most of the running time, she just pops up every 10 minutes. It's like, remember, there's this character over here. We'll do something with her. Yeah. I'm just thinking, I wonder what it would have been like had it been Catherine Keener as the suburban mom private eye. <laughs> I would pay so much money to see that movie. Don't change anything about what happens in the story, but it just has mm -hmm. that extra mm -hmm. layer of tension of being a woman descending into that seediness. Right. Right. She's a mom herself. And Keener has enough of an edge where she can still really hold her own in those scenarios. Mm. I want to see that. <laughs> that would be amazing. I would watch that so much. I love that Cage's big outbursts are ultimately that, like, the further and further he goes, it becomes less about finding the answers because it's a really simple mystery. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. CD porno producers, they kidnap this girl because they were paid to and they kill her on camera. There's no mm -hmm. mystery there and it all becomes about why. And even the why doesn't have a mystery. It's because, well, I paid them to do this because I could. Or I mm -hmm. killed her because I like it. Or I did it yeah. because the money was good. It's just these simple, twisted human reasons mm -hmm. that, again, like, go back to Seven with the seven deadly sins and all that stuff. And it's just such a simple cutting to the absolute heart of why would you do this? Because. And his reaction to that seems to be the moments where he always cracks and really breaks out his emotion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. As he digs in, he meets the character of Max California, <laughs> played by the wonderful Joaquin Phoenix. Yeah. Melissa, what did you think about Joaquin in this? I think he was having a lot of fun. Yeah. He looked like he had the best time. How many pairs of leather pants does he own? How many belly shirts? <laughs> <laughs> and I want to know what sort of gel he uses in his hair, because his hair is perfect. I know. Mm -hmm. He's having a lot of fun with the script. I kind of delight in that character whenever he shows up. And he's the single source of levity in the movie. I mean, he's not like outright cracking jokes or anything, but he brings a certain humor and a different tone than everybody else is bringing to the table. Yeah, definitely. Just like, it's my first time in New York City, the Big Bad Apple. Like, he's just so <laughs> excited to be in the back of that car. And of course, Nicholas Cage 
footage of the don't film me. (laughs) You know, that's such a simple little moment, but it's really fun. And yeah, he's the necessary informant who keeps everything going, but he's also probably the most entertaining out of the whole movie. He gives a really good performance. Yeah, I like qualities where, yeah, he's a part of the CD underworld, but he's more the witty outsider who is fully aware of why this world exists, what this world does, and how this Mm -hmm. world functions. And he's just like, yeah, I get paid to do a job. Mm -hmm. Right. But again, not in a negative way. He's just a cleric at a store. And I kind of love that he's a musician who always hoped to take off, but he ended up in this rut. And like Joel in the audio commentary actually brings up the scene from DC Cab, where it's like, I've gone from being a musician who worked as a cab Mm -hmm. driver for a living, but before you know it, I became a cab driver who always dreams of being a musician. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And how very much he saw that same theme playing out in this character. And I love the idea of, yeah, he's the informant who then thinks he's becoming the partner. You know, he's becoming the sidekick. Mm -hmm. I didn't want him to die. I thought that was sad. Neither did I. It's like, what purpose did that serve, honestly? To be threatening, I get. I think ultimately they were probably wanted to kill them both so that the two people who knew about it Mm -hmm. would be destroyed. Yeah, they were just tying up loose ends. But yeah, it was disappointing that he couldn't have saved him. Yeah. And then that whole breakup scene where it's like, yeah, here's your money, go back. And maybe next time I'm out there, I'll call you. Mm. He's like, you'll call me? Really? (laughs) (laughs) He's so crushed. Yeah. It would have been interesting if he had carried on and we could have like the further detective adventures of Max California. That'd be amazing. <laughs> the porno private eye. The porno private eye. That should have been your eight millimeter too. Oh, oh my God. Oh. That would be like a late night series on Skin of Max. Oh my God. That would be amazing. Max California, porno Max private California. eye. Max California. <laughs> and like the biggest twist is that he's asexual, so he never actually does anything in the porn industry. He yeah. just likes the people. He mm-hmm. likes the atmosphere. <laughs> I think his performance is wonderfully rich. I think the interplay between him and Cage is nice because, you know, he's the wildly over-the-top flamboyant character. Cage is the button-down guy. Initially, it was a sports coat, but Mm -hmm. then I love his, like, as he gets deeper, suddenly he's wearing a leather jacket. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Suddenly he's all in black and has sunglasses all the time. (laughs) I love how Max, whenever he goes to these underground porno markets, it's like he always sees someone he knows. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, hey, yeah, give me a call. Oh, hey, how you doing? You know? I'm going to go say hi to her. Yeah. (laughs) And he's cheerful no matter what. It's like, yeah, I know what's going on here. Oh, hi. He's just a good kid. Yeah. He's just a good kid. Mm -hmm. He's the network. (laughs) I understand why he died because, again, you needed to push Wells to the point where he would hunt down and kill two other people. Mm -hmm. Again, it's like we've solved the mystery. We know what happened. We know why it happened. We know who it happened to. But the only film that was a piece of evidence is destroyed. He's dead. He's dead. He's dead. They know where my family lives. All he can do at that point is just kill people. Yeah. I think when Cage kidnaps Eddie, it's like a last ditch effort to show me the location and show me the body and the hopes that he can find some evidence that Mm -hmm. he can bring to police. I do have to complain about there is a little bit of a lapse of logic there, Hmm. in my opinion, because all you have to do is call the cops and say, you're going to find a man with his throat cut, a man with an arrow through his, you know what I mean? Like you explain the situation, you're going to be able to get Eddie and, you know, obviously they wouldn't know machine right away, but the same way he did, they could call around at hospitals and they could figure out who he was. Mm -hmm. So it's like him murdering them isn't the only option, but I do realize that the way the movie was going that was where it needed to be. So they kill off Miss Christian and run with that. Yeah, that is one of those other things is, well, how long would that evidence still be there? Yeah. Yeah. Because Machine and Eddie are still alive and they're not going to leave any loose ends. Yeah, you have to wonder what they left behind in terms of Dino and Longdale. (laughs) Right. I mean, they could have just done away with Max's body and just left Dino and Longdale there and the police will be like, so why did these two kill each other? Yeah. I kind of want the Coen Brothers movie that takes place (laughs) along the edges (laughs) of this movie. It's like all of a sudden we have dead porno people in a warehouse. What do we do now? (laughs) Well, they kind of did that with the movie Dead Hooker in a Trunk. (laughs) I agree. Maybe he could have gone to the authorities. Mm. I like that he goes back to Mrs. Christian and then she's realizes that, oh yeah, this was all real. And then, you know, instead of like taking her evidence to the authorities, I get that she's still in the position of she doesn't want her family name destroyed. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. She wasn't going to cooperate no matter what. Yeah. And he's still got the money. So he still got paid for everything that funded everything. So there's like really no loose ends other than these people know where my family lives. Because mm-hmm. would calling the police on a scene where the bad guys have already fled have stopped them? from potentially pursuing his family. One thing I never quite figured out is where does he live? Yeah. Where is his hometown? Like how far away? Suburbia. (laughs) 
Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, he might have some time. I think he's upstate New York. Okay. They were at least close. Sometimes he feels like he's very, very close, and then sometimes he's also a plane ride away. Yeah. But it doesn't really coincide with being in New York or California. Yeah, I don't get it. Well, that's the mm. other thing, is that I think a large chunk of this story, especially on paper, was meant to dig into the seediness of L.A. in the same way that Seven dug into the seediness of New York. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But it divides its time. It like keeps jumping from suburbia yeah. to the city to New York and California. Mm-hmm. I wish it had just kind of either settled in one or the other. Yeah, I don't see yeah. any purpose to having it occur in two places. No. I don't know why you had to fly all the way back out to New York just to see Dino. Yeah. There's porn everywhere. <laughs> no, I know, but... <laughs> you don't have to go to one town, right? Yeah. I know, but I just thought it would have helped with the immersion of the world to not jump around yeah. so many places. No, no, I'm agreeing with you. That's my point. They didn't have to go somewhere else to find the studio. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's get into our bad guys. The first one we meet is Eddie Poole. Angie, what do you think about Eddie? So I just recently watched all of The Sopranos. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, oh, it's James Gandolfini. I do remember he was in this movie. He plays the sleazeball really well. Oh, yeah. mm-hmm. <laughs> and he knows how to curse with the best of them. That's for sure. He knows how to curse and kick people <laughs> in the ribs. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I was surprised watching this again. It's like, oh, yeah, James Gandolfini can also eat some scenery, too. Because once Cage mm-hmm. shoves a gun in his face and he's taking the gun in the eye <laughs> and licking it. And it's like, yeah. Licking it. Oh. Go ahead. Shoot me. Shoot me. Blow my head off. Come on. Shoot me. Yeah. Come yeah. on. Oh. Come on. <laughs> wow. Yeah. I love that they found that mixture between a guy of extreme violence and sadism and a coward. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he's kind of both, but he's also very dangerous. He's not someone who's going to instantly run away from a situation. He'll probably flip out and hurt somebody. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He's that typical casting couch sleazy mm-hmm. producer that you want to be a star, don't you? Right. Oh, yeah. And just that sadness to the story of literally Mary's first day. He's the first casting agent that she met. And on her mm-hmm. first day of auditioning, he drugged her through her in a car and they did this to her. Yeah. Yeah. Because they got the commission. It was just kind of whoever wanders into your office one day. And then, yeah, the whole sleeves all thing of, well, why did you do it? for the money. Well, why did you stand in the background to watch? Because I've never seen it before. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Again, just cutting down to the dark side of humanity. It's interesting because he almost has a little bit of a conscience about the whole thing, but then he also just quickly goes, you know what? Fuck it. Yeah. You see that sort of division in him. I'm already in too deep. Yeah. He knows he's up to his waist in shit, but he's already up to his waist in it, so fuck it. Right, exactly. And then Melissa. Yes. What did you think about the wonderfully restrained and subdued performance of... <laughs> Peter Stormare <laughs> as Dino Velvet. Dear listeners, I celebrate Peter Stormare Day ever was it August, whenever his birthday is. Every <laughs> single year, I absolutely adore Peter Stormare. He is one of my favorite character actors of all time. And this movie is, he's not given a whole lot to do. He's not in a whole lot of the movie. But when he's there, he's like eating a photograph. <laughs> he's licking it and slapping it to a wall. He's, he's literally <laughs> chewing the props. Yeah. And <laughs> that delivery of hot sauce, you know, just <laughs> wow. Wow. Peter Stamari with a crossbow. Peter Stamari with a crossbow. Wow. He bites his little pinky at that one moment. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> His performance (laughs) choices are off the wall, and I love every single one of them. He just (laughs) delights me so much. (laughs) And apparently, according to Joel, he was the sweetest, kindest man on set who would bring puppies with him. (laughs) That's what I've always heard about him. He's awesome. He's a lovely human, and people like to work with him. (laughs) And it's like every few days, his wife will come with their dogs and just flock around. Yeah. (laughs) Oh. So, Angie, what do you think about Dino? I mean... (laughs) What more can I say? Mm. No, I mean, yeah, he's very, very fun. That's for sure. (laughs) Over the top, but in a good way. He rolls in like a Stormari of nature. (laughs) Yes. Yes, he does. Yeah, no, he is one of my favorite actors. And anytime he gets to play a skeevy villain, I'm surprised this is one of the few films Mm. where he plays a character like this and didn't whip his penis out. Yeah. (laughs) Well, somebody else whipped their penis out, you know, is already taken care of in the movie. But yeah, he's the perfect choice for this pretentious porno producer who thinks he's making gothic art movies Mm. and is absolutely (laughs) willing to take a commission to kill somebody. The Jim Jarmusch of porn. (laughs) (laughs) I love that line. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Wow. And then what do you think about the character of the machine? Uh, He was just kind of there. 
I'm familiar with that actor. I can't place where I've personally seen him in. I know he does a ton of TV. So it's interesting when the mask finally comes off. It's like, yeah, he's just this ordinary looking guy with glasses and a receding hairline. There wasn't much character there, like until they pulled the mask off. I mean, he kind of served his purpose for the plot. He's Mm -hmm. this animal that always wears a leather mask and does horrible things to people. And then he takes the mask off and, aw, he's sweet to his mother. And really, nothing bad happened in his childhood. He's just that way. And I do things that I like. And I like slashing people to bits, etc., etc. Which is part of the point that the writer is hitting, that this stuff just exists because people like it. Which is an interesting angle to take the atmosphere. But... We don't actually get a character out of the guy. Mm -hmm. He's just kind of there. And he's there to remove his mask and deliver one of the morals of the story. And then he gets killed. I do want to know, was someone a Danzig fan? And so they were like, (laughs) right? They just were trying to do a little tribute or were they trying to make an association with Danzig? I don't know there. But the one thing I would say is that his little speech to him goes on a little too long. Yeah. We get it. You're a psychopath and you like killing people. Like Nicolas Cage's character is so broken by this point anyway. It's not Mm -hmm. like he needs all of that to help kill him. He's ready to kill this guy. Mm -hmm. I like the idea of him seeming Seemingly normal, but really, really sick. I mean, that's a pretty standard serial killer idea. But yeah, I don't think we needed the big longs. I really like stabbing them and I like the look on their face and all that kind of stuff. (laughs) Yeah, we've seen this before. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And also, how convenient he lives right next to a cemetery. Mm -hmm. Well, and that was when they were scouting locations. Joel literally just saw that house. (laughs) I want that house. They already had a location booked and he saw that house and they were like, let's get it. (laughs) Let's fill it with dancing posters. (laughs) You know what I'd love to see an SNL sketch? Tony Danzig, where it's Tony Danza's Glenn Danzig. (laughs) Wow. Mm Mm-mm. That, wow, combining one piece of work with another piece of work, wow. (laughs) A dark metal version of Who's the Boss? (laughs) What I like is he's basically just a muscle. He's basically just a goon who works for, you know, but I love how it's, we killed the big bad first, Mm -hmm. and then you're left with the henchman in this whole thing that kind of reveals that, well, why did you do this? Because it's fun. I like it from that perspective that the last person that he ultimately kills is just the muscle. Mm -hmm. Well, but he is the literal murderer, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, if you're really going to dig into this ooky underworld, you know, why not go for an even more complex meaning behind it? I'm doing it because I'm supporting my mother and doing all these things for, I don't know, you know, just (laughs) make it all the ways he's justified doing this to himself. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't that have been more interesting? But by that point, it's like... Like, let's close the book on this movie. <laughs> yeah. Well, and one of the big changes of the script is that we were never supposed to see his face. Oh, okay. interesting. I mean, there's the bit there at the end where after he kills him, he pulls off the mask and looks at him, but we were never supposed to see it. Mm-hmm. And so him taking off the mask and then having this whole speech about how I'm not what you expected, am I? That was all added later on. Okay. Mm-hmm. To be fair, even Walker says that he added some of that himself during his initial revisions because his whole you never see his face was just douchebaggery. <laughs> Yeah. And the whole thing was that in the snuff film, he was kind of scrawny and wiry. And then in some of the other films by Dino that we see him in, he's getting bigger and bigger. When we finally meet him in person, he's like a fully roided out bodybuilder. Mm-hmm. Okay. And so you were supposed to see this physical change and the only really identifying marks were the tattoo and then the mask. Okay. But yeah, he was supposed to be this whole tattooed bodybuilder covered with acne. Oh, wow. Just from all the steroids he was taking. Mm. Yeah. I'm thinking Joel was like, well, I just did that with pain. <laughs> <laughs> I'm fine that they got kind of a smaller, chubbier guy and that he's literally mm. a guy next door, much like in contrast how the detective is a guy next door living in this. Mm-hmm. It, it would be funny is if Machine lived on the same street as him. <laughs> well, yeah. Ch- when he says, oh. Take off your mask. Wait, I know you. Yeah. Harvey? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, that would bring us back around to even like David Lynch stuff, where yeah. that's Twin Peaks, that's Blue Velvet. Yeah. Yeah. This is all paths that we have tread before yeah. in movies. <laughs> well, and that was one of the big changes that Walker didn't like was originally the girl was supposed to be from a wholesome white picket fence suburban family. And nobody knew at all why she ran away. It was supposed to be this perfect home, this perfect life. And the mother just sitting there like, I don't know why she ran. 
And it's not instead of her stepdad, it was her actual dad who then committed suicide like six months after she ran away. Mm -hmm. And of course, in the diary, it's still the same thing of, you know, she was being molested by the father and she ran away and the mother never even knew. Does she actually say that in the diary? I seem to recall her just saying like, yeah, you know, he's such a jackass. I have to get out of here. I don't remember her Mm -hmm. saying she was abused. Yeah, they were. Yeah, the script was, again, more explicit about it. Uh, Yeah, we actually had a lot more of the diary where it's like as we have a montage of him searching around we hear more about the first time that it happened okay you know how she can't sleep anymore because she doesn't know when the door's gonna open mm. and she just has to get out of that house when she doesn't believe her mother would believe her none of the boyfriend the boyfriend was all added but then we got baby norman reedus out of it so. yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> Just a few seconds of Norman Reedus. Mm -hmm. I love Joel on the commentary saying, yeah, this Norman Reedus guy, I think he's going to go places. Because the commentary was recorded like right when the film was made. Oh, okay. Of course. Now we got Norman Reedus CGI with a baby inside him. It is interesting the addition Norman Reedus, but again, that's a thread that I don't really need because it doesn't go anywhere. It's this whole thing of my boyfriend's going to be a big action star and I'll go out to Hollywood with him. And he's like, yeah, I screwed her once or twice. I don't know why she thought you'd come with me. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Unless it's that whole thing of she thought she had an escape, but then found herself alone. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, so what do you think about the whole sequences with Mary's mother? <sighs> Some parts of them are kind of odd, like Nicolas Cage just arriving in her home and suddenly he's touching her shoulder. It's like, mm, that seems odd. Yeah. I mean, it makes sense in a movie-movie sort of way, but it uh, that feels strange. Also, the things he's finding are places that police would look. Right. <laughs> like, how many things get hidden inside toilet tanks? <laughs> a lot of things. That would have been searched. Why hadn't that been found? In the script, it was a silverware box in the attic. Oh, see, that would have been better. But still, it feels like there were some steps missed there in presentation of the scene. I mean, I like the presentation of the mother. I mean, losing a child, it's something you don't just bounce back from. That's something that follows you every day of your life from then on with the missing child. I mean, I feel like they at least got that portrayal. Yeah, I agree. I think she does a really good job of expressing the pain, the loneliness, the loss. The one Mm -hmm. scene where he comes back and she's like, oh, I made enough for two. Your heart's just breaking for her because she's just so alone and she just desperately wants some companionship. And it seems pretty clear that his last visit was probably the first visit she got in quite some time. But the whole idea of he's the one that finds the diary, it also just seems kind of unnecessary. Mm -hmm. She could have just been like, if you want a little more info, you know, if you didn't read this in the file or whatever, here's her diary to look through. Like, why wouldn't the police have found it? Why wouldn't she have found it in all this time? It doesn't quite make sense. But beyond that, her performance is great. It is. Although there's something to her performance where I feel like this may have been in the script. It feels like she doesn't exist outside those scenes. Like, this woman probably still has a job. She probably still goes outside of the house and sees people. I mean, she seems able-bodied. Yeah, he does find her at her job the first time. Yeah, yeah, she's bagging groceries. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. But I mean, that character seems so enclosed, especially after five, six years. Honestly, that's actually the biggest difference with the script is there is a lot of loss of, there's a lot of locations in the script where, again, like him and her go out to a bar, you know, he finds her at work. Mm -hmm. There's scenes of him, again, like going to a homeless shelter where no, they don't see her, go to another one where no, they don't see her before he gets to the nun that did see her. There was a lot of detective work in the script that is off screen now. Right. Mm. And a lot of just getting out of the locations. I'm betting it was more of a budget thing. Probably so. One of my favorite scenes in the script is in like page two. As they're establishing this character as he's returning home from a case and it's like he's in a tiny coach seat on an airplane with a tiny meal that he's trying to eat with tiny silverware. And this one woman (laughs) comes back from the bathroom and he has to get up and they do this little dance around the seats and she gets back in and then he sits down and starts working on his tiny meal with his tiny silverware again. (laughs) And it's one of those scripts where you can see why they would cut it because you'd have to get an airplane location and extras and all that stuff. And it's Mm -hmm. not really a moment other than just establishing, again, the world. Right. This tiny little everything is perfect world of the white pick offense private eye even as it's all absurdly chaotic and joel schumacher certainly isn't david lynch 
Because <laughs> I feel like the perfect director for that sort of stuff is David Lynch, because he can get that everything is perfect in the veneer, and then, oh my god, look at all the stuff underneath. But again, mm-hmm. Joel is someone who has done films that are all about building the world that these people oh, are in. I mean, again, like yeah. even you know, going back to DC Cab, Car Wash, Cousins, he's made worlds that you can get immersed in, mm-hmm. but this is just one of those ones where, again, it's like they pull back and they stripped it down so much. Yeah. yeah. It's like they took a very expansive script and they minimalized it. And mm-hmm. I understand that from a budgetary point of view, but it just loses a lot of the little extra details that made the script so engaging. And then the mother, I know two of the biggest things that were what led Walker to leave the project were changes involving the mother. The first was that when he called her, that he literally says, give me your permission. Yeah. Mm. That's... Because then he's putting it all on her. Yeah, that phone call is so not okay. (laughs) (laughs) Well, and the thing is, in the script, you have the phone call, but the whole point of the phone call is just to reveal to this woman how awful everything that he's learned is, just to pump himself up to the point where he will go in that room and kill that man. (laughs) And it's, again, pouring out not only all this awfulness, but his own guilt and his own yeah. feelings of insecurity and all that stuff and then mm-hmm. just to drive himself up to the emotional point where he will kill a human being okay by then the big change was just putting in give me your permission just by doing that you're changing the whole context of that call right right yeah, yeah i mean you've still got the emotional intensity there without that and then the other one was that she wrote him the letter at the end Oh. That letter wasn't in the script, and he hated the letter. Yeah, I can see that. I guess it was to wrap it all up in a neat bow kind of thing. Like, yeah, it was all worth it because she's happy about it. You know, like that kind of... And hooray, we can kind of smile a little at the end. Roll credits. (laughs) You remember that bit where he returns home and he just is sobbing and he goes up to his wife and says, save me? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The way the original script was is that he returns home and he's kind of shell-shocked and it's kind of a PTSD exploration where... It's this little like five minute epilogue where he returns home and he says, just don't ask me where I was. I'll tell you someday, but I can't right now. Mm -hmm. He just tries to settle back in, you know, feeding his daughter, mowing his lawn, going about his day to day things, interviewing new clients. And it gets to the point where he's just driving home. And as he's driving home, he just starts to burst into tears and has to pull over. And then he comes back home, goes up to his wife and just says, I'm going to tell you everything. And it's just like sobbing in her lap. And that's the end of the script. Mm. See, that would be better. Where it's like he tries to bottle it up and move on, and he Mm -hmm. just can't and has to pour it all out. And that, yeah, the final interaction with the mother was the phone call, which is, again, horrible, but Mm. in a way that's fitting of the story. Right. And yeah, there was no, like, envelope from the widow of, like, here, give this to the mother of the girl. Mm. Mm -hmm. That was a nice touch, at least. Because, I mean, clearly she was so tortured that her husband did this. It made sense to me that she would want to offer something. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and then that was another one of the big changes was you don't have a final call between him and Mrs. Christian. Mm. He has the confrontation with the lawyer, returns Mm -hmm. home, and as he's getting his wife out of the house, says, now I need to call Mrs. Christian. And she says, we got word two days ago that she was dead. So subtly hinting that the lawyer offed her before he came to the meeting. Oh, Uh, okay. Tying up loose ends. Yeah. Yeah. The script and the movie are not really that different. It's just a lot of the details, a lot of the context. And I know part Mm -hmm. of it was they had a lot more inserts, like as they're going down, like the porno flea market, little things that would just kind of really like bombard you with what is this world? What is this imagery? You know, there's the whole porno scene with the enema and all that stuff. And Mm -hmm. there was going to be a lot more of that to just kind of envelop you into the world. They had to run this film through the MPAA four times before they got an R rating. And they basically (laughs) had to strip all that out. I will say I do feel like, not that the general public often does either, but the movie doesn't do a good job of saying, yeah, some of this stuff is crazy and weird, but it's consenting adults and let them do whatever they want versus this is sick and twisted and they killed a girl. You know what I mean? Like It feels like he's already being corrupted just because he's watching S&M porn. Mm -hmm. Right. The script got a lot more into that with the Max character of, like, again, establishing, here's the world of pornography, now here's the world beyond pornography. Mm -hmm, All the people up here, they're just doing what they do, it gets them off, everyone's happy, everyone gets paid, everyone's fine in the end. 
Then you get below that, it starts to get murkier and people are genuinely being hurt by it. Right. And then the snuff was even below that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I could see that that's what the movie was trying to do, but what is remaining on screen after being cut down, Mm -hmm. most of what we see isn't even what is on screen that is being watched. It's we are watching other people watch it. Yeah. And since we can't see ourselves what the crazy thing on screen is, our Mm -hmm. only gateway into what they're seeing is watching them react. And so much of what's left is Nicolas Cage reacting reacting to awful things. Yeah. But I do kind of love that scene where they're watching the snuff films definitely coming from the Philippines. And he's like, oh my God, she's not breathing. And then they pop in another one. It's like, is that the same girl? Oh, it's the same girl. Oh, thank God. And they realize they're all fake. Yeah. (laughs) Right. That was one of the good scenes that hits. Yes. Yeah. And I wish we had had more of that. I agree. Yes. That's where I say like, it's a good TV movie adaptation of a really juicy novel that just doesn't have the juice. (laughs) Yeah. It it has the story there. It's hitting all the beats. It just doesn't have that bite that the original work had. Mm -hmm. You have an entire movie about getting into the nasty under the underlayer of underground porn. And it's not particularly shocking movie. It's one where I'm surprised we didn't get an unrated cut. When you watch Seven, yeah, you can't really see what has happened to these people who have been murdered, but you get these really graphic, awful descriptions of what Mm -hmm. has happened. And it lets your mind wander in and go, oh God, and imagine things that are worse than what they could even put on screen. Whereas 8mm doesn't quite know how to bring that out, Yeah, you know, without actually putting it on screen. They also skipped out on the parts where it's not just Nicolas Cage going, oh, this is sickening. You have to bring that back to the audience to say, this is why it's sickening. This is the sickening thing. They do have the one nice moment where he's in that underground market. I say nice moment, but (laughs) he walks up and it just says kids. Yeah. Oh, God. Yeah. And that makes you feel that like, uh, kind of moment. And he stops to just look at the photos and... That's nice and affecting. And I mean, it's not that I necessarily want to see a bunch of really horrible things, but I do feel like there was probably a better way to present it that could make us feel it rather than just always watching him react. Right. I mean, like you think about Seven, where again, it opens with that whole montage of him putting his diaries together. Mm -hmm. And one of the most horrifying things isn't even the murder scenes. It's walking into that apartment filled with those diaries. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that tiny scrawled writing and they just pull it open and just reading his thoughts Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's when the film is at its even darkest, given how dark that film is. Yeah. Yeah. Or again, like, yeah, there's the whole scene where the guy is forced to have sex with a woman with a bladed dildo. We don't see any of that. We just see this absolutely broken guy in a witness room saying what happened. And then you see a quick flash of that dildo. Yeah. Yeah. It gets under your skin. This is one of those ones where it's like, it's a perfectly decent film. It has a good story, good cast, but it just doesn't get under your skin. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Even as it's presenting ideas and themes that should get under your skin. Right. It's like everything that should get under your skin is in here. It's just not being presented in a way that actually gets there. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's my biggest thing is where I still recommend the movie. It's fine. It's worth checking out, but it's not like a high Mm -hmm. recommend. You have to see this. Right. It's not one of Joel's best movies. No. And again, I think... If he had brought more of a fury to it, more of an energy, more of a even just more emotion to it, Mm -hmm. I think it would have sold well. I mean, like, again, you look at Flatliners and compare it to this. Yeah. Yeah. The whole scene with the neo-Nazi and falling down in the back of his store, if this had that intensity. Yeah. But again, I'm wondering if because he went so far with Batman and Robin, he's like pulling back in the opposite direction a little too far. Yeah. Or was it the censors? Yeah. I would love to see an unrated cut because there's not an unrated cut. There's no deleted scenes. Mm hmm. So what did you all think of the score? Because it had this very interesting tribal quality to it. It was all over the place. Yeah. Yeah. Like, there's some that are just nice and moody. Then there's, okay, Trent Reznor wasn't doing soundtracks (laughs) yet, so let's do some orchestration with some weird sounds on top of Mm -hmm. it. And then there was the tribal stuff. And then the trilling, yeah. And I'm like, I really hope you picked that because it evokes in a mood and not because it's foreign. So it's weird. You know what I mean? That was a little odd. It was a little distracting at times. It was uh, Michael Donna who, this was his first studio film. He had been coming up in the indie market by doing Adam E. Goyen's movies Mm -hmm. and still does. And he does stuff like Life of Pi and he did the score for Little Miss Sunshine. (laughs) Okay. It's odd music choices. It's like, yeah, are you banking on the exoticness of the way this sounds, the tribalism or what? 
there wasn't a cohesion to it. Mm -hmm. That's my issue with it. I think it was supposed to be the whole disconnect thing of this is different. So maybe it's off putting and then that will give you this more intensity to the scene. But instead, it's just yeah. kind of making you be like, huh. Yeah, I'm wondering if the composer was thinking, well, we don't want to do the standard porn soundtrack, but we want some <laughs> sort of animalistic beat. Hey, mm. tribal music. If any movie needed a saxophone. <laughs> oh, God. It's your porno underworld movie. Oh, no. Oh, no. I, mm, no. Just keep no. it the industrial. I think it would work better. <laughs> yeah. Something like this. The machine with his saxophone. If Aphex Twin had scored the whole thing, yeah. I would have very different opinions on this movie. <laughs> <laughs> that would be interesting. Yeah. One other thing I wanted to mention was initially when Joel was doing this movie, he had just seen Romper Stomper and really wanted to work with Russell Crowe. And Russell Crowe had gotten his hands on the script and was like, oh, dude, I'd love to do this with you. Hmm. Oh. Because Russell Crowe wasn't an established star at the time. The original plan was to do just a really super low budget, gritty, handheld, scratchy 16 millimeter, just make the entire film look like this really scratchy, grungy thing that's been drugged to the sewers. Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> but then Nicolas Cage and the studio came and said, you know, Nicolas Cage had just had the one, two, three punch of Con Air, mm -hmm. The Rock, and Face Off mm -hmm, and yeah. was at the top of his box office game and bringing him in would be a higher budget, be more polished, but also more studio interface. And so Joel was literally like, I'm fine with directing either of these movies. Which one do you want me to do? He, he literally said to the studios and they chose the Nicolas mm -hmm. Cage one. But imagine like a super ultra gritty, grimy, low budget one starring a young Russell Crowe. I'd all for it. When Russell Crowe plays kind of a lowbrow thug character, it's like, wow, <laughs> I get all the Twitter for that. And from like the insider, he can also do that bookish everyday suburban husband, you know? He can. Mm-hmm. I wish we had gotten that movie. I wish we could see the earlier cuts with Cage. Mm. It's just one of those ones where I don't hate the movie we have. I just wish it was something more. Right. Yeah. Again, like my Batman and Robin feelings. It's like, I don't mind what's there. I just wish it had gone even further. It's a perfectly serviceable movie. It's all right. It doesn't push boundaries. It has a couple of moments of magic, particularly in Stomari land. You know, whatever happens whenever Peter Stomari comes on screen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, you know, other than that, it's like eh, somewhat unremarkable. One little tiny, tiny roll, blink and you miss it. When he's first coming to Marianne's mother's house and the neighbor sees mm. him, I immediately went, oh, Chloe, because she was <laughs> Chloe in Fight Club. <laughs> Oh. Yes. <laughs> Rachel Singer is the actress's name. And it, like I said, it's a very, very short role, but it was just like, oh, Chloe, yay. Mm -hmm. So I was very excited to see her. <laughs> I also noticed that there's a credit in the credits for Computer Wizard. <laughs> Now, who would who be is the, the computer, the computer wizard? wizard? When he does the enhance part, mm. oh. you know, he goes to the computer bank and they do the enhance thing. And it's like, yeah. no, you can't do that with it. Anyway. No. Getting into the box office release of the film came out in February 26, 1999. It was one of two films that Joel had in theaters in 1999. He had both this and Flawless, which we'll be doing next. The budget for this ultimately ended up being $36 million, which seems a little higher than you'd expect. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But again, I would love to have had that stripped down $10 million gritty one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Me too. Other films that were out that week, already playing in theaters, we had Blast from the Past, <laughs> She's All That, Oh God, mm. Shakespeare in Love, mm -hmm. October Sky, My Favorite Martian, <laughs> Message in a Bottle, and Payback. That's a collection of movies. Wow. Mm -hmm. And the movie going public was completely unaware that The Matrix was about to take them by the eyeballs and shake them. I know, right? <laughs> Opening that week at number three was The Other Sister. Mm -hmm. oh, okay, yeah, I remember that. And 8mm did open at number one. Oh, mm -hmm. nice. Albeit only a $14 million number one opening, but not terrible. Eh. No, it's February. So in its second week of release, 8mm has dropped to number three. Mm -hmm. Opening at number... Oh, man, this is a one-two punch. Opening at number two is Cruel Intentions. Ooh. Okay. Which I remember just had legs. I remember that one had legs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then opening at number one was Analyze This. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, how young and naive we all were. <laughs> Oof. So in its third week of release, 8mm is already down to number nine. Ooh, ouch. And oh boy, listen to this lineup. 
All of these opened in the same week. Opening at number seven was Wing Commander. (laughs) Okay. Opening at number six was The Deep End of the Ocean. Mm. Opening at number five was Baby Geniuses. Oh, God. (gasps) Opening at number four was The Corrupter, the Chow Yun-Fat Mark Wahlberg movie. Oh, yeah. Okay. And opening at number two, Angie, The Rage Carry 2. Oh. I think that's the first project you and I ever collaborated on. Oh, dear. I believe so. (laughs) So in its fourth week of release, let's just see where it's at. It is already down to number 15, so we'll stop here. Opening that week was The King and I at number six, speaking of Chai and Fat. Yeah. (laughs) No, wait, no, he did Anna and the King. This is the animated one. Oh, remember remember there was the animated one? Oh. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that didn't go very far. Opening at number three is Clint Eastwood's True Crime. Mm. Analyze This is still number two. (laughs) And opening at number one was Forces of Nature. Oh, boy. Boy, did we need the Matrix in that year. (laughs) So, yeah, this was an interesting year for movies. And ultimately, the domestic box office for 8mm was only $36 million. Oh, wait, no, wait. Mm -hmm. Hang on. I said Mm -hmm. that was the budget. Yeah. No, I apologize. I don't know what the budget is, but the box office was 36. Ah. Okay. Okay. And the international yeah. was 59, so total it only did 96. Okay. It made a profit, mm-hmm. but it wasn't a huge hit. Yeah. Right. And I know critically it was kind of all over the place. Roger Ebert was one of the few that gave it a good review. Mm-hmm. Everyone else was just kind of like, eh, it's flat and gross. Yeah. Yeah. It was not quite what Joel needed after Batman and Robin to kind of resuscitate his career, but it didn't hurt. Mm-hmm. There was a sort of sequel, a film that was produced completely separately, and they decided to just release it as 8mm 2. It was originally called The Velvet Side of Hell. What? Okay. And it was directed by J.S. Cordon, who was famous for making the vampire movie The Forsaken, mm. which is a very forsaken movie. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. And this directed video sequel, despite not having anything to do with 8mm, I can see why they rebranded that because it's, it's not a terrible movie. It's a film about a couple of man, woman, fiancés. They're part of a wealthy family that's part of the American consulate in Budapest. Okay. What? So this film was filmed on location in Budapest. And while they're off on a weekend trip, they end up having a three-way with a woman they meet in a nightclub, only to find out when they get back home, hey, here's an eight millimeter film of you all having that three-way and they're, of course, being blackmailed. So as his husband and wife trying to find the people involved with the making of this film so they, A, don't have to pay them and B, can get rid of the film. And it's this husband and wife going into this underworld of the sex industry in Budapest. And what makes it an interesting film, it's still not a great film, but I like the interesting edge, is the husband and wife going into this together. That's interesting. Mm. That's an interesting angle. There are a couple that do genuinely have a chemistry and do have a relationship, but they also have a kind of sexual playfulness. And like the three-way was the wife's idea. She's the one who met the woman and they're both really into it. They both had fun that evening. Mm -hmm. As they're going into this, yeah, it's this husband and wife together going into these sex clubs and this underworld. And this is a very unrated movie. It's naked all (laughs) over the place. (laughs) This was that brief era where you could actually put like three seconds of a blowjob in a movie that you're selling at Target. (laughs) You know, it's that kind of an unrated movie. I mean, it's still kind of flat and dry because J.S. Cardone basically directs on the level of your average episode of Red Shoe Diaries. Oh, Mm -hmm. yeah. But it's not terrible. The plot unfolds with some good twists and it's a decent enough mystery. A big twist at the ending that you don't see coming. It's actually got that gritty underworld feel that's missing from 8mm. And again, just that whole husband and wife going into this dynamic together is different. Mm -hmm. And you don't see that in many other films. And like from beginning to end, they are together. It adds tensions to their relationships as they're seeing things they can't unsee, but they're seeing it together. And they even have scenes where they're processing it and pushing through it together. And it's a really nice (laughs) exploration of a couple stuck in the middle of a noir together. (laughs) I'm wondering like how many other noirs like have a husband and wife, like not the thin man, but like a gritty thin man. (laughs) Yeah, I was going to say thin man. Yeah, but a gritty thin man, you know? A gritty thin man. (laughs) Mickey Spillane's the thin man, you know? Oh my God. (laughs) So, I mean, it is interesting enough that if you enjoy 8mm and you want to see something kind of along the same lines, it's not bad. But then I did also check out the 1979 film Paul Schrader's Hardcore. How was that? It's actually a very good film. Mm -hmm. This one, I think, is the film that 8mm is trying to be. Yeah. Okay. Because it's super seedy and sleazy. It super immerses you in this world. And it's about George C. Scott... Average, like Episcopalian, lives in the suburbs. His daughter is on a field trip and goes missing. 
And he hires a detective to find her. And like, you know, a month later, the detective played by Peter Boyle comes back and is like, I need you to see this. And it's an eight millimeter porno film of his daughter in a three way. Mm -hmm. Does he really need him to see that? I mean, can you just tell him about it? Uh, That's one of the most brutal scenes of the movie is a father seeing its daughter in that. Uh. Yeah. And it's a skeezy movie. But it, it then him going to California and just delving into the underworld of the porno industry to try to find his daughter. There's even times where he's putting on a fake mustache and pretending to be a producer so he can audition young men in the hopes that one of the men from the porno film comes into his hotel room. One of them does, and he beats the shit out of the guy. Wow. Similar to how you have the relationship between the detective and Max California, you have him developing a relationship with a prostitute and porn star who's able to, like, hook him up with producers and get him into the industry and kind of gets into this whole thing of, like, mm-hmm. you know, she hopes that he'll take her out of this world and it doesn't end up going well. And It's not a film where it all comes together, but it's definitely got that atmosphere and that vibe, and it's a really interesting trek into that world. And Paul Schrader is really good at writing stuff like that. Yes. And he directed it too. Yeah. And this is Paul Schrader at the height of his powers. This is 1970s Paul Schrader. Coming right off a taxi driver with the same cinematographer. Mm. And right about to go into Raging Bull. Yeah. Okay. And Paul Schrader, I'll admit, while he does explore very skeevy subjects, he is a very, very intelligent and skilled screenwriter. Mm -hmm. I mean, his scripts are impeccably well-crafted and rich and deep and insightful. And as a director, he ain't bad. Yeah. He's a very clean, crisp director. And I mean, sometimes he'll go off the wall with cat people. <laughs> <laughs> I also really like his film Autofocus, which was the story of the star of Hogan's Heroes, who was a sex oh, addict yeah. that led to that guy's brutal murder. Like really good film and hardcore is very much a film along those lines. Yeah. So again, like eight millimeter, I recommend it, but I absolutely do recommend hardcore. It's not going to be for everyone, but it's a really well-made, mm. smart, intelligent movie. Okay. So that's all I got. Melissa, thank you for joining us once again. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Noel. Thank you, Angie. It's always a pleasure to be here. All right. And that wraps up another episode of Shumacast. Good night, everybody. Good night. For additional episodes or to leave a comment, please visit shumacast.blogspot.com. That's S-C-H-U-M-A-C-A-S-T dot blogspot dot com. Our opening song, Letter, and our closing song, Vein Blossom, were both created by Jack Locke and are used with permission. To hear more, please visit jacklock.com. That's J-A-K-L-O-C-K-E dot com. Schumacast is in no way affiliated with Joel Schumacher or the copyright holders of the films discussed. All rights are reserved and no infringement is intended. 